Can I see your notes? Will you let me see your notes? I just spilled on them and everything. Will you, I want to see them. I am so curious. What are we working? Oh my God. Oh my God. You gonna read these? No, no, no. This was just this me, just your like, kind of. I'm, I'm curious. Thinking. I'm curious. Oh my god! I um, when you um, so what else do you prep for, like this? Uh, so er- t- earlier today, I had to do a recap of Q, our last quarter, for our our company. I've done a number of panel discussions. Oh, I have great stories about prepping. You know, I had to do when I was in Informatica on stage at in Vegas get there and it's a revolving stage that goes around in circles i i like hate <laughs> what does that mean revolving stage the stage went around it was a it was an, it was a kickoff you're like in a arena <laughs> and it's so you can speak to the audience no it would move so that they could see me every like right so the uh, different portions of the audience could see <laughs> there's you. like mirrors and i'm like it, this is my absolute worst nightmare how much did you prep for that well um I, so the VP of sales or the CRO at the time, like had me go during the day and it was a complete unmitigated disaster. So I spent the entire night walking around my room in a square doing it. The, the presentation. All night. Yeah. Does it make you nervous? Yeah. I'm like, I was like, if people say you're in what you're afraid of your shadow when you were younger, yeah, this is. So like this stuff makes you nerve uncomfortable. This doesn't make me uncomfortable. Um, Being yeah. in front of a lot of people. Yeah. And um, I'm curious, when you do your prep, are you, um, like, what's the goal? Are you memorizing certain things? Are there certain things that you come back to as um, points of emphasis? Like, how does your prep actually work? <laughs> it's not terribly organized like that. My, I think the thing that causes me to do it most of the time is... And because it's for the people who work for me, I'm focused on ensuring that they get the fact that I appreciate the work they do. And I don't think I, I, I know so many great storytellers. I suck as a storyteller. Uh And so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to tell, what's the narrative I'm going to tell that's going to get that point across. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I, I do what everybody else does. I compare myself to the last person I saw and I'm like, Oh, I suck at that. Or, yeah. um, so what I generally do is like with this one, it was just writing down a lot of things yeah. and just think I was thinking about things that really impacted me in my life. And yeah. I wrote, I don't know, three years ago, a purpose statement more from like, why am I doing this now still? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know to your question in that situation in Vegas, it was conveying information in a way that would be easy for people to understand. I had a situation <laughs> where I did a Bessemer thing, I think it was. Yeah. And Steve Young came on after me. Uh-huh. Like. It's good company. M- my absolute worst nightmare, though. Like, <laughs> really? Well, because because you have to open up for Steve Young? Yeah. Well, I, you know, actually, he was before me. I was after him. And and can you explain that to me? Is it imposter syndrome? Like, is it because. Oh, you talk about this all the time. You're trying I, this I'm, No, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Like, why do you feel that way? Like, why do you say, are you kidding me? Because I think my natural state is to be an observer and to think. It's not to speak. Yeah. And, and you think, man, Steve has so much to say. How could I possibly have what Steve is going to say yeah. in my arsenal? There you go. That makes sense. Well, I will say I did love Steve Young's book, and he does have a lot of really interesting things to say. <laughs> I've never read his book. Oh, I'll you have read his book. I'll send it to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm actually grinding right now to get him on the pod. I'm, you really? I'm working hard on it. Oh, good. He's like, a, I have a Mount Rushmore of guests. Uh-huh. He's one of them. Who are the other people? Elon. Ooh, that would be interesting. Uh, Benioff. Are you, really? He's not, this is his kind of thing, isn't it? I have, and I have infiltrated the Salesforce army, <laughs> like deep. You know, like I know all of his direct reports. I know his executive team. He's just not, he's just unavailable. Wow, I had a I had a one on one interview with him, and with Mark, uh huh, a long time ago, and it was to run the commercial sales business, and it was maybe twenty minutes. But in that twenty minutes, he like figured out why I wasn't going to take the job, and he called you out on it totally. 
I had a fella named Jim Steele on the show. And Jim was employee 150 at Salesforce, mm-hmm. came in as the president. Do you know Jim? I don't. I know of him. Okay, I okay. Know him. Yeah. Anyway, he was telling a story about how he did at least 19 interviews with Mark. He interviewed with Mark's uh, therapist, coach. He interviewed, Mark's wife interviewed him, like full on. He's no joke. Yeah. Mark's no joke. No. No. Were wow. You, yeah. That was how, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Em, employee 150. Yeah. That was like. Yeah, it was in that range, probably. How, uh, do you regret that? No, I don't. W- at what all. was the reason that he said that you weren't going to take the job? Because I didn't want to be away from my kids. He was uh-huh. right. He completely nailed it. And and uh, would you have been away from your kids because it was not an inside sales job? It was a managing a field team where you'd have to go out into the field and it territory. Was, they were so little, and it was it was in San Francisco, and I lived in Los Altos, <laughs> and I was just like, if something happened, okay, how do so I you, get to him? You don't regret it. No, no, I don't regret it. Was it intense? How much did you prep for that one? Or at the time, were you like, what is the, what is I this knew, dinky I little knew, thing? No, 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 I knew about it. I knew about it. Um, and I loved their marketing, obviously. Like, you know, it was just, everybody knew about it. Um, I was just more intrigued more than anything. And I was, I think I was at Informatica at the time. Yeah. And then I had lunch with him with my, with the VP of sales at Informatica who just worshiped the ground he walked on. Mm-hmm. I was like, I think it's one of those weird things where that would usually be me, but because he was doing it so much, I'm like, relax. Yeah. It would usually be you that you kind of like uh, look up to a bunch of these people that you get to meet. Yeah. When you meet these people that you look up to, do they live up to your expectations? Many of them do. Like who? (laughs) Um, By the way, they don't have to be business people. Oh, Oh, Billy Bean. <laughs> you met him? Oh, it's awesome. Uh-huh. Uh, gosh. Um, now that you're thinking about it in this context, people who would... Clinton? Bill or Hillary? Bill. Hillary, not so much. Okay. Bill, yeah, but I'm... Yeah. Met um, your expectations? Just, yeah, watching him interact with people and how he, how well he does that. I mean, I, I, you could tell that I'm like focused on that for people, how, how people do it kind of interacting and listening and, yeah. you know, playing black back. Um, I don't know. I'm going to just completely f- switch on you. I actually used Chris Degnan the other day in a, in a presentation. No way. Cause he, he was an inside sales rep for me. Uh huh. And I, I was talking about grit. I, I wasn't really specifically speaking about grit, but I was talking about when the dot com bust happened, and you, there was a sentence in one of your in your podcast that uh-huh. he used. I used it when I was talking to my team about the current state. What did it, what was the sentence? Do you remember? Yeah, he said, um, "When it happened, I sat down and figured out where I was going to go, like what was I going to do next." With regards to territory, because all his com- all of the you know all of his his, his clients just died. Yeah. yeah, so he figured out that he could he could cross sell, he could expand the customer base. Mm. And then I I he didn't say this in the in the in the notes of this uh, recording, but he actually asked me for the central region as a territory, which was brilliant. Degnan? Yeah, right. Because that's. <laughs> this is Chris Degnan for the audience listening. Uh, CRO of Snowflake, employee number like thirteen there. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Oh, let me ask you this because I can't help it. And I, I love Chris is a friend of mine and, uh, and ah. like a, a role model and a, like I'm lucky to call him a friend. Um, did you uh, and hindsight's 2020. And so I guess as best as you can, not reconstructing the obvious narrative. Could you see the potential oozing out of him? Oh, yeah. You good? Oh, yeah. I, Was he I, a dog then too? Well, I vividly remember a QBR that we did, um, and I, I, may, I may even have one of the deal reviews that he did because he was so diligent and so earnest. Um, and he knew, I mean, the, the greatest thing to find is when somebody sits down with you and can articulate what they want from their lives. And you're like, my job is to make sure you get there then. Mm-hmm. Cause if you're that focused on where you want to go, then I'm going to get you there. Have you reconnected with him? Um, no, I, the last time I talked to him was he was trying to sell box snowflake 
<laughs> and while the person, you were there. When I was there and the person who was the, the decision maker, um, just like, he's so annoying. He just is so persistent. Chris. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I all, yeah. So, you know, um, and I, the, what I said to the folks on my team, as I said, to your point of going back to your point about who do you look up to? Like that's somebody that people look up to. And I remember when, right? Like the hard, you put in the hard yards, good things will happen. And that was the whole premise of his thing. The other thing he said, I am absolutely not the smartest guy in the room, but I will work the hardest. Yeah. You know, the, the pulling on this, this idea of, of meeting your heroes and stuff and, and dreaming about what you could be and then meeting them. Like Chris is definitely in that camp for me. Honestly, most of the people, including you, that I get to sit across the table from are in that camp for me. And one of the things that uh, Chris and I share is this, you know, this fear, like this anxiety that everything's just going to like evaporate pretty quickly. And what's interesting is when I meet people that I share these types of feelings with that I'm usually, you know, don't come up very easily for me. Um in one sense, it makes me feel good, you mm-hmm. know? It makes me feel like, wow, these people feel the same way that I do, and they're doing what they're doing. But in another way, it also scares me, because the question that I ask myself, that I continue to ask myself all the time is, is the reason they are where they are because they feel this way, if that makes sense? Like this- it Totally makes sense. Like this thing, like, uh, like if Chris didn't have that, that anxiety, would he be where he is? You know, so, and so, so like that, that, that's the question that I honestly keep coming back to, uh, for myself. So I suffer from the same thing. Mm-hmm. I always think about it could all disappear tomorrow. What would I do? Yeah. Um, and I think that comes from having a parent who was a depression kid and just like, you know, you hear so many stories about their life and what happened and, you know, not being able to provide for themselves. And then candidly, the second one was when I was in college, my parents got divorced and like, I then had to figure out how to pay for school. And, uh, when you say depression kid, meaning, uh, your parents, your parents were, my dad was, yeah, were, Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then, um, and then I guess the, the, the thing that they whether or not they meant to or not passed down to you is this feeling of scarcity. Scarcity and yeah, absolutely. Scarcity and you get what you work for. Like everything comes to those who work really hard. Um, The other thing that, that it, that was that created the fear was when you're in a situation where you don't know how you're going to take care of yourself, you, you basically have to come become very resourceful. An example is when I was at UCLA, um, my car was towed from the street because I left it on the street too long. And my roommate, who was very well off, said, she's freaking out. <laughs> she said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm a, it's in a place that's locked up. I'm fine until I have the money to pay for it. I'm going to leave it there. What I realized in that moment was there are things that happen in your life that build character and they cause you to react to situations in certain ways and problem solve in certain ways. And for me, you know, going back to the sphere thing is I was always trying to figure out what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Cause if I, which you can't, I mean, I've learned that mm-hmm. now I'm very old, but like you cannot predict the future, but you can actually, you, after making many mistakes, you can't figure out like what I should or shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, can I, can I interject? One of the things that I recently read or heard somewhere was that human beings are the only species in the world that can create a separation um, between what happens to them and how they respond to it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like if you, you know, if you, I don't know, like hit a animal or something, it'll bite you. Mm -hmm. The, the way that he said it was that we have the ability to discern between stimulus and response. And we're the only animal that can do that. Yep. And I thought, gosh, that's like, uh, that's really interesting. It kind of reminds me of what you're saying. Well, and I think that the more you do what we do where we're responding to people and people are watching how we respond, the more you have to 
be balanced in it. Like you have to have it in your head going on versus the way you might just react, say, at home. For instance, uh, people need to see you that calm. They can see you as as intense, but the ability to stay calm in a situation that's going completely sideways mm. is actually something that, from a leadership perspective, becomes very important, at least I've found. My nor normal state is probably pretty calm. Like, I don't get fired up about, I don't get fired up, like, frustrated about something until it's really bad. Mm. And in a situation at work, it's more... I'll get, I'll get frustrated about the small stuff, but when something really big happens, I tend to get very focused on how to solve. I the actually problem. generally agree with you. The small stuff tends to tip me over much more <laughs> exactly. easily than the big stuff. Yep. Because at least with the big stuff, I recognize this is big and important and at times existential. Yep. The last thing I need to do, it's like the paper cuts that destroy me. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you know? Me too. Yeah. I, I totally know. Um, yeah. Like push deals. Yes. <laughs> Kill me. Kills you. Yes. Kills me. What do you mean? Because I do the thing of what did we miss? Like, what could we have done differently? Why you did we You mean push deal hurts you more than like a lost deal? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. You, um, you mentioned a few years ago that you wrote a purpose statement. What, what does that mean? What that means is I was trying to figure out what motivates me to get up in the morning and do what I do. And what I mean by that is... At the time, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And I was really trying to figure out, because it had changed, why I was doing what I was doing. Because from, the, from where I was at that point, I'm like, well, I've done everything my parents thought I should do. I have the title. And I was like, well, what do I do next? And I, I am not like one of those people who love, like, loves huge companies. I really do thrive in the, the kind of more scrappy situation and in the, the high growth piece. Mm -hmm. But I got to the point where I'm like, okay, I've done it now. And it became like, I need to understand why I continue to do this. And so I wrote down what matters to me. Um, and I did it partially because I have two sons and I wasn't at home with them. And I felt like I, needed to write down why I wasn't doing that instead. Do you so, remember the list? Yeah. Why? The reasons do you remember, why? Did you, yeah, do you remember the things you wrote down? Yeah. <laughs> Can I pull my piece of paper here? No. No, I want to I hear <laughs> Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I want to hear it. Yeah. Like um, maybe the, maybe the, like the highest order bits. What were yeah, the things that um, were like the biggest, big, big rocks? I love, there is something absolutely fulfilling about watching somebody develop their career and achieve success yeah. and it's it's like it doesn't matter what the deal was um i i find the process of scaling and the trying to figure out what is repeatable about something fascinating and i also love um helping people change their mindsets um and what i mean by that is you know i've seen so many sellers go from feature function selling to value selling and just the transformation that takes place when they can have, mm -hmm. you know, the, the different kinds of conversations, the, 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 mostly the, the conversation with the C person who they didn't think they could ever have the conversation with. So yeah. you know, if you look at my career, I've been very focused on SDR through to commercial and have recently done enterprise and that whole process of somebody developing across their career is drives me. Um, and then I, I love to learn. I, I find every situation an opportunity to, to learn something new and different. And I've had, you know, in the places I've worked from, um, remedy to MySQL to Informatica, to box, um, to segment, to jump wildly different leaders And each one of them in his own right is a great leader and they are all so different. So I, I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, and I am super, I've always been super, super curious about what one, what drives people and what drives, you know, why companies develop, some companies succeed and some companies fail. So I think at the end of the day, it's, it's like curiosity. And I always, I wanted to be a teacher. And I think in, the, in, in a little way, I get to do that every day. Um, this is going to sound like a weird question, but bear with me. Um, have you ever thought why you love to learn? Why I love to learn? Have I? Th um, no, 
actually why I love to learn. Um, have Would I you do the thought exercise with me right yeah, now? Yeah, absolutely. All right. You want me to go first? Yeah. I can go first. I think um, I shouldn't. Have, I shouldn't have volunteered myself to go first. No, I'll go first. Then. Okay, good, good, okay. good. Because I've never thought about why it. Why do I love to learn? Um, so I, I do. I actually, I'm glad you gave me the time to think about good. it. Um, I think. I think with most things, you the, the great mastery. Like if you think about what mastery is, um, you when you are learning, you have this opportunity to go from the place you are to a, a different place. And then the, the, if you stop and look back, you think, wow, that was, that was an amazing journey. Like that whole process of learning. And then, and then the, it, it enriches kind of what you then do next. Yeah. Um, I also just love people's stories. You know, I, if, if I can take one thing away from the stories or the things that I learn, um, that I can then use to show up better for the next thing I do. I, I just think that's why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. What would you have said? Um, I think that was a good answer. Honestly, I think, um, I would probably say that I, um, I like to learn about, um, like what my limits are <laughs> uh -huh. and, um, the only way that I can learn what my limits are, or maybe said in other ways, like what my potential could be is by taking things from the outside world, feeding them into my own mm -hmm. whatever fucked up algorithm is going on <laughs> inside, and then continuing to like iterate things on the model and like improving. And I think, um, I think for me, the idea of improvement just gets me closer to feeling like I'm striving to achieve my potential. And I think what everything is about for me is seeing what the ceiling is. And so like going back to your comment on, I like building startups and I like the early stage, I feel the exact same way. I mean, I'm in this startup business, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, said another way, I'm in the underdog business, which is, which right. is betting on people that um, really um, are trying to do the impossible. And I think that, you know, they're trying to see what their potential is and what their company's potential is. And I find that like a very magical thing. And I think maybe taking that one step further, and I'm just thinking out loud with you, so bear with me for kind of a long answer. But I think the reason why I loved being in startups is because there is such a high correlation between your input and your output. Absolutely. And if the startup, imagine you pick right, goes well, then there's going to be all these jobs that are out ahead of you that you can start to like step into when you're not really ready and then you keep learning more and then you start getting closer to what your perceived potential could be. And I, I, I find that only startups or put another way, high growth, early stage companies give you the ability to fast track your potential in a way that I've never seen before. Um, and so maybe that's why I like learning and that's especially why I like startups. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Um, you, know, you you talk about the ceiling piece, about what is the ceiling. And yeah, that resonated with me because yeah, I'm not a huge daredevil. Um, but things like, you know, how far, how fast, how far can I push my physical limits? And then with startups, it really is kind of the same thing, which is, you know, how much can we how far can we take this yeah. and and what will it mean to the people who are part of this? And that's also the, just the, the amazing thing about building companies is you, you have this sense of belonging or kinship slash tribe with the people you built, you built this, this business with. Yeah. Um, and I've experienced it coming back to me. Like, you know, you, you start one place and you come all the way back to it. 10 years later when you are working with somebody you worked with when you were, you know, 10 I, years before. I totally, it's, it's I totally agree. When you wrote your purpose statement, <laughs> was that before you joined segment? Yes. And I wonder, is the reason that you wrote the purpose statement because you came, that's off the heels of two different start and stops of companies <laughs> yes. that were maybe less than two year shifts. One at, uh, Facebook doing yep. the, uh, workplace by Facebook. And then the second was, Narvar? Narvar. Narvar, yeah. Yeah. Like, is that is that where it came from? I don't know, maybe. Uh. Yeah, no, that you're, it's, it's absolutely, it, it definitely was a driver for it because I was trying to decide if I wanted to be the, the leader, the CRO. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I'd actually decided maybe that's not what I want to do. Um, why? I think it's a good question because I am not a person who likes to be like in front all the time. Yeah. Similar to like getting on stage. Yeah. And there was a, if you've read the book, good to great, like it's like the second in command. I always thought I was going to be that person. Yeah. And I actually built a lot of my career around that. Um, and, and you know, I, I enjoyed it. So being put, Narvar was a little different, maybe because it, that was more of a, they didn't want a CRO at the time that they said they wanted a CRO. But it did, you're right. It made me think about why I'm doing what I'm doing, especially going to segment because I was going to be theoretically taking a step back to do commercial sales when I first went in there. Right. Because you were taking on the whole number at those previous two companies, even though it turns out they just weren't the right fit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but what I, you know, at that point, if you just step back from your ego for a second, you realize it's about who you work with and your ability. Like that's so much a part of what you are able to build is the people you are building it with. Yeah. And I knew, you know, I, I knew Joe Morrissey was going to be somebody I could build something with. Yeah. And I also knew, yeah, I just, I just trusted in that. And it just didn't matter to me anymore. Like what the ego part of it was. Well, I got to imagine it was uh, particularly hard because you had the ride of basically your career at box <laughs> leading up to those two. Oh. I don't know. Um, you disagree with that? I, I wouldn't disagree. I let's just, just say you had a great ride at Box. You, right? I did. I like loved in Box. the sense that it was yeah. like seven, eight years. Yeah, it was eight years. It was uh, it was as long as Informatica. Yeah, and you ended up like running pretty much all commercial sales, right? Yeah. Um, and then to go take, I'm going to call them L's. Uh, you can call them whatever you want, but the, you know they weren't Box type runs, right? No. And, um, that must have been. Uh, you must have been asking yourself some pretty tough questions. And I think especially when you have kids at home, which it sounds like you did, and you just had this great run, you're starting to doubt yourself because you missed twice in a row now. Yep. (laughs) And you're like, I knew I shouldn't have gone to Facebook. I knew I shouldn't have tried to build this thing. I knew I shouldn't have been the number one person. I knew I should have stayed as the number two and taken on enterprise, blah, blah, blah. I imagine there's a lot of self-doubt creeping in that's exacerbated by the fact that the opportunity cost of you doing those things and taking those L's and bashing your head against the wall, spending time with your kids, watching them grow up. <laughs> wow. I feel like I've just been in a therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think to, to answer your question, I think I felt like I could finally do something that was wildly unpredictable when I did the Facebook thing. Cause I really believed in what they were going to do. Facebook wasn't my place. Like it's not, it's not the startup. It's not the high growth thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you, you're making me think really hard about this, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've made too many decisions recently on emotion versus <laughs> calculation. But doesn't that, um, that surprises me because all of the conversations that I've had with everyone in your life is that you're so calculated, that mm-hmm. you're so data oriented. I am. That yeah. you run your business so detail oriented in numbers and data. You're so grounded in the data. I- I'm surprised to hear that the decisions that you make in the in the career moves were what you described as maybe the opposite of, of data oriented, emotional. Yeah. So, you know, I, I there's a person who worked for me, her name's Lauren, and she said, you know, I think I realize why I do the data. And when she said it, I'm like, that's exactly why I do the data. Cause it's sort of like a security blanket for some reason. I, you know, and, and by the way, and when I mean security blanket, I mean that it, it is the backing for you to go to lean forward into, to having conviction about something, it, having the data behind you really helps mm-hmm. that, um, in your personal life, <laughs> uh, at the point I was at when I made those decisions, like I could have some disasters, which maybe wasn't the wasn't the case when I was when I went into box, is I really needed to have for, you know financially. A You're win. saying you had a cushion. Yeah, a cushion, yeah. and so I could take some of these risks, and you know, like I was thinking, well, you know, Facebook, it's it's like a, the company, like yeah. you know, yeah, go work at one of those big ones. Yeah, 
Um, and I really did believe in what they were doing. I think they're, they're, it, was a, it was an experiment to take a consumer company and turn it into an enterprise or to build an or, enterprise organization inside of it. So I did go there also to learn because I really want, I was really curious about how Facebook was how, monetizing all the stuff. Yeah, and, how great companies are great. And just how they managed to do it off of the back of this social yeah. thing. Like just huge yeah. revenues, yeah. right? Um, super interesting, learned a lot. And then, um, you know, I think in a way I was running away to the next one, mm -hmm. candidly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> running away from? From the fact that I wasn't a Facebook person. Oh, you were running, you were running from something, not to something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, when, can I revisit another comment that you made? Um, yeah. I ask you if I can, even though I'm going to, um, when, um, <laughs> on, uh, on the, your parents, uh, divorcing, that was when you were in college mm -hmm. and had they paid your tuition? <laughs> So it wasn't a great divorce. So they were having discussions about how it was going to get paid. In the uh -huh. meantime, I had to figure out how to pay for it. Got it. So. And like, uh, um, maybe this is more uh, selfish inquiry now, but like, why has that stuck with you? Because, you know, you have a moment there where you're like, well, how am I going to do this? I got to figure out how to be in school and how to pay for it. Mm hmm. Um, and I was working at the time. It just meant, okay, you just go get more jobs mm -hmm. and you figure out how to do it. And I think it was a moment for me where I realized I can do this. You know, I can, I can get resourceful and mm -hmm. actually figure out how to solve some of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, if you had asked my parents, they wouldn't have said I was that kid. You know, I, I think my father said you would not have, you would not have been the one out of the three that I would have picked to be doing what you're doing. You would have been the one that was going to do the quiet thing. Interesting. And, um, did you believe that? Like, did you believe that sense of self? Cause it's interesting. For a long time. Yeah. 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 And when you were growing up, uh, sounds like you have two other siblings mm -hmm. and your parents were together when you were growing up. What was, what did you talk about? The, like you what, always ask this question. Yeah, I love this question. question. I love this question. <laughs> we, what did we talk about? Um, mostly my dad's family. And like, those are the things I remember is the stories about my dad's family and how he, they, like my dad built this, like built himself up to the successful attorney that had a firm in, in where I grew up um, and put him, you know, put himself through college and then you know, stories about going to Stanford and then going to Cal and it was, how that it was achievement oriented. It was very achievement or oriented. Actually, everything was, that's great. But you, you know, what if you, so it was sort of like the constant, like raising the bar, yeah. which, which I think, you know, shows up in my life all the time. Yeah. Um, and I think my father never saw himself as actually achieving, even though he has, he's done wonderful things for the environment and wonderful things in his career. Yeah. And that goes to, by the way, that's kind of the conversation that I was having earlier with you about like, um, I wonder if he needs to feel that level of dissatisfaction, discontent <laughs> yes, in order to have achieved what he did. You know, it feels yeah. like a double edged sword. Yeah, I think um, I think there's a reason why I've done what I've done is because the environments I'm in are not finished. They need to be finished, and they're they have discontent associated with them. If you want to put it that way, it's it's there's something to strive for. Yeah, and you know, I think what I have learned what I have learned is you have to stop and reflect and recognize that you've made progress because I think the thing that I was accused of earlier in my career is I would just keep going. It would be like, you know, recognize the fact that we've made progress because you have made progress. Yeah. And this is the thing about startups. They're not finished the day you walk in. They're just getting started. You have to remind yourself of that, like that it is messy. Yeah. Um, and I have to, like, I constantly have to remind myself of that. Yeah. What I, um, now I feel like I'm just psychoanalyzing you, but what I do you find, are. what I do find really interesting I don't is know why this is interesting. What I, <laughs> what I do find very interesting is that now you have two daughters. I have two sons, two sons, and they're both BDRs in sales. Yep. Right. <laughs> Technology. Uh, um, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
Yeah, I, 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 but it took him a while to get there. Yeah. Like my, my younger one fought it. And, um, did you think this is where they would be? No, no. I thought, well, my, my older one, yes, probably. Um, my younger one, no, I thought he would be doing something more, you know, from an art, art oriented music, something like that. And did you think they learned this from mom at the dinner table growing up? What we're talking about right now? Did you think that they like hear about like I assume yes. I imagine that your conversations also probably centered around achievement and work because that was probably yes, yes. So absolutely, like it's not a coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence because my younger one actually pursued a company because I was talking about it so much. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we share a favorite book. I don't know if you know this. Um, the obstacle is the way. Oh, Ryan Holiday. Yeah. Absolutely. Stoicism. Oh, my <laughs> yes. God. It's one of your talking points. <laughs> yeah, we actually are getting him to speak at our kickoff. Come on. Aren't you just jealous? Huh? So jealous. He's also on the Mount Rushmore of good guests that I want. Is he really? That's, yeah. He's oh, crazy. he's my. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you love about him? What do you love about the book or him? Well, I usually listen to him running. And so it's great. He's a great thing to listen to while you're running because it is all about like, I just love the word courage and what that means, you know, and how, you know, that you have a choice about, you know, one, how you show up and then what you do to change the current state and then how you show up in, in those times when it's really hard. And I think it just, it just resonates with me in some of the things that we do every day that you, you have a choice every time you do something, you know, you can get ticked off about it. Or you can figure out how to solve it. Mm. And that the obstacle is the way, like that particular statement about in the story about the rock and pe what people do when they walk up to the rock, you know, they, they look at it, Tell they the walk story. away. <laughs> okay. So the, the story goes that there was a king, I'm going to get some of this wrong, I'm sure. There's That's a king, okay. yeah, who um, puts a rock in the road to see what people will do with it. And on the other side of the rock is gold. Mm -hmm. Right. So the first person walks up, looks at the rock, turns around and walks away because it's in his way, his or her way. Um, the second person walks up to the rock, looks at the walk, rock, leans against it, tries, tries to move it, tries a little bit, turns around and walks away. Third person comes up, looks at the rock, stands away from the rock, comes back and looks at the rock, goes and gets a stick and puts it under the rock and moves the rock and finds the gold. Like mm -hmm. I, that's a really, mm -hmm. I didn't do that justice. But the point being is that if you, if you can figure out a way to go through something or around something to get to the other side, you're generally better off for having done it. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's what's been a theme of my life is all of the hard things that I've done have, have resulted in a much better situation having gone through them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think in the, the journey, you know, you, as you grow up, much of it is about the achievement, the actual achievement, and it's not about the journey to the achievement. And I think that's that's what I've learned in all of this being in these startup companies. It's the journey, like the, the part, the richness of the journey, and and they, and the, he talks a lot about those kinds of things. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. W one thing that that reminds me of, or that makes me think of, which is kind of random, is I think when people look out for short stints in someone's career where there's a lot of one, two year hops, 18 months. My impression is that the reason that people are trepidatious about hiring that profile of person is because they're generally the person that looks at the rock and walks away. Because if you haven't been anywhere for two years, mm -hmm. you really haven't even given an earnest effort mm -hmm. like to try mm -hmm. and get around the rock, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so it's almost a tell, I feel like, which is I think, Maybe, I don't know. That's just, well, okay, know. so you've actually surfaced something for me. And I, I, so I think there's two things that happen there. There's the, your, you're part of the team and then you're in the front, which is if you look at the things that have changed about my career, it's the being in the front that's been like the uncomfortable part, the most recent part of like, oh, which is goes back to your imposter syndrome, right? Like, mm. can I do this? What does it look like? And when you're the person who people are looking at to have the answer, you all of a sudden are like, well, how did I get here? Mm. Like 
I'm in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And then you actually have to go through the, well, maybe you're not. You realize, well, there's a lot of wisdom that you've gained in those experiences that you've had. Um, and they, you're not, they're not, the experience isn't the answer. It's, it's an input. Um, and it's, it's funny that you're talking to me about this now because I'm going through, like, I go through this, what you're talking about right now with the, the rock probably every day. I mean, this environment, there is a rock in front of a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, and it, and the thing we all need to do in this environment is figure out how to help people understand that, you know, that the hard yards are going to be the ones that they remember that are going to grow them the most. Um, and it goes, I mean, and I, I remember in my career, those, those times, and it really is when you have to figure out how to navigate a sale or a situation in a way that is completely foreign to you. Um, and you have to like pull on all of those, like all of the things you do and don't know how to do. And you actually are forced to actually put them into action in a rigorous way. And then you have to do it again and you have to do it again and you have to do it again. And sometimes they fail and sometimes, and sometimes they work. The working time feels a hell of a lot better. Like it just feels better. Cause it's just, you know, exactly what you put into it to get out of it, you know, to get the outcome. Mm. And that goes back to this whole journey thing, which is right now, if you watch, you know, if you're looking at the market, it's, you could spend all of your time focused on the outside forces that you have no control mm -hmm. over. But the, the folks who will achieve, and this is going back to Chris, is are the, are the ones who sit down and say, I'm going to focus on the things I have control over. And I know this is completely overstated. Like mm -hmm. people say this all the time, mm -hmm. you know, you're, 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 you control the controllable. I mean, so outside of Ryan Holiday, the other person who I hugely admire is Churchill. Like if you just look at the guy who had things that, that were outside of control and just stayed focused on what he could control and being persistent about it. Um, in any case, when, and I think that's why I, I wanted to be here to talk about this with you mm -hmm. is because I think we're in a point with the number of things that are going on, like there's like all the forces we're faced with the COVID what's happened after COVID happening to companies, the war, um, the, the macroeconomic situation with like what's happening in tech. Um, is that happening outside of tech or is it going to happen outside mm -hmm. of tech? Those are all things we can't control. You know, um, the comment that you made about Churchill, um, one of the things that he's notorious for is his ability to prioritize. And, um, and the thing that he figured out going back to controlling the controllables is he has an unbelievable ability to figure out what mattered mm -hmm. and then an even better ability to ignore everything else. Yeah. And when you're Churchill or when you're honestly any leader going through any period of time that's difficult, it looks like a lot of things matter. Absolutely. There's only like one or two. Mm hmm. And the ability to take something that looks important uh, and and put it to the side, like his pride, like the like it's unbelievable. Like that's what that's yes. that's how he controlled yes. the controllable. Very good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you were at Box, so you mentioned. Um, so when you were at Box, did did you tell me this? Did somebody else tell me this? Did you write something about how to work with a founder? <laughs> yeah, in, in in lieu of uh working with uh Aaron? Yeah, I did. When when did you do that? What like what time frame did you do that? Oh we after were... you after you left? Oh no no. Uh uh I was asked to do it for this is the, the Bessemer thing I was asked to do. Okay, they asked you to how to work with CEOs? Yeah, because there was a bunch of CEOs. I mean this is a really interesting story. Um and I, you know, I sat down with his chief of staff, who's a fabulous person. And we like, we sort of took Aaron apart. Like, what is it? Why does he do what he does? Cause he's very in intentional in, in what he does. And he, he, he's amazing at getting people fired up about doing what they're doing. Um, and he, the man can see around corners and he hires people who are operational for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that's what became the, the crux of the narrative was, Aaron very intentionally will throw something out that sounds like wild and, and 
undoable. And then he'll say, how, like, you need to go figure out how to do it. And he does it because, you know, if you have an operator's mindset, you will break it down into its parts and pieces and find out, like, I, I will ask myself, why can't I do it? Or mm. why, how would it look like if I did it? Um, that's not what, like, that's at the time, that wasn't what he was known for. What he was known for was like having the ability to look out beyond where we are right now and think about where we were going to go. And, but he would put the ones, he would have the folks in the business focus on how do I operationalize that idea and how do I 10 X? What were the, uh, do you remember the talking points of like, what were your, what were your key takeaways on? Mm -hmm. the, the three takeaways were one, you know, is you, you break it down. Is is there a market for what he just said? Um, how would I go about building the business plan around that? In other words, how would I, how would I find the resources? What's it going to cost? What's the return? Like all of the things that you do as an operator. Um, and then where does it fit in what we're doing today? And then how would I sell it? Not just to, if it's a, a product or a, a new way of doing things, but it's a, how do I sell it internally? How do I, how do I make it work internally? And then how do I actually take it out to the market? Um, and he knows that like, I, I immediately go to that. And my big one is how do you make that thing repeatable? What's the process for mm -hmm. how to make that repeatable? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think, I don't, I don't know if that's a characteristic of all founders, but you know, what makes founders so amazing is their ability to find product market fit and, and then to be maniacally focused on making sure that they achieve that. And I mean, if you look at box, I mean, it is one of the most amazing stories about, you know, four guys who met in high school, mm -hmm. um, and then two that have remained, I don't know, is it 15 years now? Aaron's coming on the show, by the way. Oh, is it? Yeah. I love Aaron. Yeah, he's great. Um, but these are like, these are two guys who shouldn't be doing what they're doing and they are killing it. Yeah. And they are like, they are going up when everybody else is going down. They are crushing and, it right now. And it's because they are constant learners. I mean, Aaron, he would go around the valley and figure out where, what, like, what mistake did you make? I mean, for one, at one point it was, I remember months, it was, you, you need to hire, you need to hire past the, the capacity. You need to hire past the capacity. I'm like, Aaron, who said that to you? He's like, Benioff. <laughs> It was, it was that, or it was some other thing, yeah, but yeah. that's what it was. It was, he, and it, 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 what was so fun about it is you were trying to figure out how to tell him he was wrong and insane. And in doing that, you would actually solve the problem. Yeah. Oftentimes. Yeah. Um, any other things that come to mind that were part of the, how to, how to work with the CEO? Yeah. Well, one of the other ones, you have to be prepared when you sit in front of them like and before you, have to, you go into a meeting, yeah. I mean, you, you had no problem with that. I'm yeah. Sure. I actually had a CEO tell me, I trust that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. He's like, you don't need to come in here with all the facts all the time. Yeah. I'm like, and he said, and I'm, he said, why do you do that? I said, I think I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. He said, yeah. guess what? Tomorrow's a new day. You get to start all over again. Yeah, I'm that's like, true. Wow. That that's was good, good advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so other, other, uh, pieces about working with founders, um, you know, I, I what I have learned is, there's a lot of recency bias. It, like what they just heard from somebody uh, else that yes. they admire. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I think that one of the things that's so wonderful about the world we live in is that there is the opportunity to go talk to so many different people. But every experience that you have is related to that business. Mm -hmm. It isn't your business. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, like, I think it's, uh, this is, again, one of the things that Aaron was so good at is he would take that in, he would bring it to our e-staff meetings, and then we would talk about it. Like, how does this fit in our organization? Does it fit in our organization? I mean, the battle about capacity was one we had, like, every single week. Um, things, like, th things that he really believed in that he wouldn't have naturally done, like being rigorous about the KPIs and how we ran through the KPIs, not just to run through the KPIs, but because they were telling us where we were going or they needed to be telling us where they were going. We weren't just like reporting the news. We were like going through those KPIs because we needed to activate something, do more of, stop doing, mm -hmm. figure out how to do better. Mm -hmm. Like that was the intention of those e-staff meetings. Um, I think sometimes we get in these situations where we're just reporting the news and not really recognizing why we're doing what we're doing. Mm. And I think that that's like, you have to ask the question why. 
Speaking of founders, um, Peter Reinhardt was on the show. Was he? What a what a gem, no pun intended, of a human. And um, we're sitting in this room, and in the work that I was doing, trying to get to know who Peter is, he tell truth. Tell me if this is true. I mean, I know it's true. So maybe tell me what you think about it. But did you go to the office? Did you go to the segment office? Mm-hmm. Okay, he would like put plants. Mm-hmm. In different parts of the office in order for the equilibrium of oxygen and CO2 to be the same. He would put noise machines in the perfectly placed areas and then reallocate the types of teams that needed to be by certain types of noise so that the the decibel levels was consistent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what I don't think that people realize about founders Going back to your comment about being ready and maniacal about the details is they are maniacal about the details. You're right. They are unbelievable about the things that they see. Yes. And so I think going to your point of why you've done all this preparation and stuff, you've worked with a lot of founders and <laughs> and you will die on the vine if you, because the weird thing about a Peter or an Aaron is they're, it's almost savant-like. It they is. could have never done a sales job in their entire life yet. They understand the business so well that they can ask you the questions mm-hmm. so precisely mm-hmm. that you need to know the answers to. And they don't even know necessarily what they're asking. They just know they need to ask it because they understand so the business so intricately. Yeah, that is absolutely. Yeah, that's yes. Um, and, and so when when you when you have that level of attention to detail, it's hard for people to understand what that means. Like it's hard for people to really realize, um, like I think sometimes they get a knock for recency bias or learning and all these things. It's um, the reason why I love working with founders so much is if it's not working for you, you can quit. Yes. They can't. No. Like they are going down with the ship. That's, I so admire that. And, um, and so when you do that, you have no choice but to be inordinate about how paranoid you are, right? And, and go into a level of detail that is unfathomable. And so I think I have a suspicion that you earn the respect of these people when they also see in your own world the level with which you go into your detail. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, I think that is probably a pretty big unlock for you in building trust with them. But do you think that's fair? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great observation. Yeah. And I think, um, so I think there's a lot, like basically what they want to see in my opinion is that you care about things as much as they care about things. And, um, because like, this is not just a company they're building. This is a legacy that they're building. That's right. And in a lot of cases, this is their whole identity wrapped up into it. And in even more cases in Aaron or Peter's case, they don't have this huge cushion behind them. This is like their family that they need to take care of. And so there's a lot of ways to show that you care. That's why like the things around hard work are so important to these people. That's why when you display or demonstrate some otherworldly characteristic that they see in themselves, <laughs> they know that you're in it with them. And I think it's hard to explain how important that is. The, yeah, absolutely. The in it with them is a critical, critical piece. And to your point about that, this, this is their identity. Absolutely. Um, and like the, this mission to change the world in some way, like that it is amazing to your point about how much they know about what they know about, like the depth to which, and they will change the world. I mean, if you look at what Peter's doing now, like what is amazing about Peter is that he had a successful business with Segment and then he went to, and he was doing charm at the same time. I mean, that's his love, right? That's, you, you described him in the, in the office doing the balancing of all of, all of that. That's, you know, that's part of who he is and what he cares about. Um, and he's a very private person. Like, 
you didn't know. I mean, the, the closest to him probably knew, but he, the, this the work he was doing at Charm while he was also going through segment was just insane. Like you just think about the mental capacity it takes to do two of those things at the same time. Yeah, I totally right? agree. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's pretty amazing. Both of those people are really, really good human beings. They are actually really good human beings. And, Low ego, and they're not always like that. No, I agree. I absolutely agree. Yeah, they are both exceptional. They are. I can't wait to talk to Aaron. You've never talked to Aaron? Uh, we've talked, but not, you know, it's different when you step into the dojo. It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. different. It's yeah, different. you'll have fun. I can't wait. You'll have wait. fun. I yeah. can't wait. Um, yeah. It's going to be a lot of exuberant energy, I think, flying around. Yeah, the first time I met Aaron, um, it was on a Saturday, and he could not sit in it. First of all, he doesn't put his feet on the floor. He sat in the chair, with, like he's, he perches in the chair. <laughs> out of so excitement yeah just like he just exudes yeah. i don't i mean he's that was a long time ago yeah but yeah he is he is you can almost like physically see him he's physically thinking like yeah. it is just energy field around him which is a you know that's why i was there for eight years because you just it's just contagious yeah 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 and he was by the way as a salesperson he was the absolute best salesperson you could ever have yeah because he's authentic authentic and he's, yeah. tr he's trustworthy. Yep. And he was in it with you. I mean, when we were closing out quarters, he was there. Uh, my partner, Mamoon, who did, what was it the A or something uh -huh. like early days of like before they even switched to B to B, I think, um, the, his framing for founders that he uses Aaron as the benchmark for is uh, OFB, and it, I think him and Aaron came up with this, which is open for business, and Aaron is so open always, for business. Always. You know, he wants to sell yes. the product that they he built. He and does. this sounds weird to say, a lot of founders are not totally open for business. No, no, I think, I think you're absolutely right. They don't have an orientation around, like, let's go sell this thing mm -hmm. to the world. Yep. A and Aaron is not that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Aaron loves it. Yeah, he loves, he loves it. it. Like his his passion was our user conference. It was he was maniacal about getting as many people as he possibly could to the user conference because he wanted to understand all of the use cases and how he's going to grow the business and you know showcasing their success. Uh, um, before I forget, can you give the the thirty seconds on what does Gem do? Yes, um, Gem enables you to capture talent. Um, it's basically a candidate management platform. Yeah. Um, why is that important? Because what we have today is we have a lot of sourcing and we have a lot of applicant tracking. We don't have the candidate funnel, like the process that the candidate goes through to, um, become a, a an employee. And the most important resource we have in our business are the resource, the, the employees that we have, the people. So it, what it does is think of it as a, um, Sort of like a CRM, you know, a sales CRM. Yeah. It's a candidate CRM. Yeah, that's how I think about it too. Yeah. That's the, that's when I was doing my work on it. That's exactly how it uh, came off to me. Yep. Um, and it's it's relationship oriented. Similar, Absolutely similar relationship to a oriented. CRM. Yes. Um, pipeline management, the candidate all of it. pipeline exactly. engagement, personalization. It's is a over a billion dollar valuation. You pick your cool venture capital firm, and they're probably on the cap table. Yep. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm laughing because you joined in August of 22, <laughs> which was, what is that? Eight months ago? Yeah. Eight months ago. months ago. So, so just you joined a recruiting platform, um, in what was very obviously at that point, a downturn in the market when people are cutting heads. Um, <laughs> can you, um, maybe, can you just tell me your calculus on this one? <laughs> Uh, you had to ask. I could help. It. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so it's a long game. That's all. That, that's what I'll say. Second, I have now been in two places where the second question asked after what's your forecast is what you're hiring and when are you going to have the butts and seats? Yeah. So, the, you know, the, the talent is timeless and this, if you're not focused on high tech, high growth companies, the war for talent is still there. Um, it goes to the comment about, is it harder? It's harder. Yeah, absolutely. Is it like, was it 
my timing sucked. Absolutely. Did I know that it probably sucked? I did. Do I believe in what we're doing? Absolutely. And at this stage, like I really believe that we have an opportunity at GEM to change the way that companies engage with talent, mostly the relationship between the recruiting organization and the hiring manager. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Um, but why now? No, no. The why now, like, uh, honestly, the why now, maybe not to put words in your mouth, but it's like, let's go back to our framing of um, you don't even know if you can get around the rock for three years. Like no, we're, exactly. we're in the we're in the like not even second inning of approaching the rock. That's right. Um, and so um, at this point in your career, um, you know, it, it's you've had your like really good runs. Like you've made great money. Like your your kids are in school now. Like you're doing this for a reason. Yeah, you know. They're, and yeah. there's not going to be that many more. There's not going to be that many more. And so, um, when you do one, you might as well take a long term orientation towards it. Yeah, and I have to say. And this- by the way, sorry to interrupt you, but like, let's imagine this thing comes back, and let's imagine this thing comes back in the way that we think it will. Like, guess where you are? Like in position A. That's yeah. You you did a podcast with Porco a couple of days ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dennis. Yeah, yeah. So, so I remember when Porco was very small, and your your story there was like, mm-hmm, that sounds like something that I'm planning. Yeah, something that I think is going to happen. I really I think that finding the right talent at the right time is one of the hardest things that any hiring manager does. And I think Jem is on to something. Now there's like lots of hard work to do, but every single one of these companies has lots of hard work. I, I mean, you can look at Box the same way. Exactly. Look, <laughs> and, and you joined Box in uh, 2011. Dropbox was killing us. 2011. You could say uh, 12 years later, it's just now inflecting. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And that's the thing is. It's is, up so much. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so fun to watch what's happened there um, because they did the hard work. Yeah. And they stuck to it. Um, and this one. And they laid, a, uh, they laid a strong foundation. Well, and they listened. The other thing they did is they really listened. There was hard decisions made there. I mean, that's the, you know, the churn challenge that they had at one point. Mm-hmm. You know, watching Google and Microsoft come into the market, like these big, huge companies come into the market, um, figuring out how to build a platform. I mean, I, I think that's probably part of it is I can see some of those things now that I couldn't see earlier in my career. Totally. And... I really believe that this candidate management piece and how we create relationships with candidates is going to matter. Like, I'm going to ask you how many people, how many times have you had to go through your email to try to find the person that you wanted to talk to that was so great or your, your connections because you didn't have it somewhere that you could go back to easily, you know, that you, you didn't have the, the, the way that you came and, and engaged with those people was like when there was a moment that you had to have, of you course. had to hire somebody. This enables you to have a talent pool always available to you. And it enables you to build the relationship, not just for the moment in which you want to hire somebody, but for the, for the, to actually build a real relationship that but, is timeless. Leslie, I'm curious, um, mm-hmm. does, does Jem do anything um, unique in their culture around recruiting? Like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's like why I'm there. Anything that, yeah. Tell, tell me like what, like, uh, yeah, I was, I was not going to do this again. Like you were done. I was done. I like, was like, at least going to take time off, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and you had a great run in segment. I, yeah. I mean, I, you know, acquired by Twilio, acquired by Twilio. I mean, well, but yeah, I mean, I, still out on honestly, how I was looking for another box. I would have stayed there for a long time if it was, if it hadn't gone through the Twilio acquisition, which was great. Yeah, Don't yeah, get me sure. wrong. And it was, uh, you know, great experience you know, but not for me long-term Yeah, going back to what I love to do. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was thinking like, I'm going to go travel and do, do other things. And, but I met Steve and Steve is an amazing recruiter. Um, and it is amazing, you know, folks who are, are pretty early on in their career that are just like the CFO, Susan is freaking rock star. So that's the other thing is you look at this talent and you think like we could build something really great here. Yeah. And then just the way that the the team has showed up as far as in a very tough environment, taking on a new CRO, it's like, it's hard to have a new CRO, but the way that they just show up. So why was Steve an amazing recruiter? Steve's the founder, right? Um, 
be, yes, he, he's the founder and, and because he was so persistent and because of the way that they communicate with me. Describe the persistence. <laughs> it's what you said before. The level of detail he had about the business and that he was willing to share with me was like unheard of compared to the other places that I have been and, and his authenticity um, and recognition of where they were and where they want to be was it, it was just, he was super candid and, and the process they took me through, <laughs> I was actually, uh, at an offsite in Boston. I was like, I don't have the time to do this. And somehow he managed to get me on the phone for five hours to do interviews. And I was like, not even looking for a job. Mm -hmm. It's cause I was so interested in talking to the people. I'm like, I might be missing something. So it's that, it's like, Hmm, what are you missing? And because <laughs> I, I think he also caught me at a point where the problem that they are solving was so acute for me. Because we'd gone through a situation with Twilio where we, we we had an overlay, and then we decided to um, kind of have Twilio or segment go back to being a direct of sales force, yeah. which meant that I had to like turn around and hire a hundred people. And I, you know, I just my brain was like, oh my god, I remember the last time we did this was so yeah, it was so hard. It was a bunch of spreadsheets and try to integrate like try to map map the spreadsheets together. And I had just recently figured out that Twilio had Gem. No kidding. And I was using it um, not only to send sequences, but also to manage the pipeline process for how are we moving candidates through the pipeline and why was it taking so long and why, you know, and starting SLAs. And so it really became a tool for me to actually own, the, to own and drive the process. Yeah. And if you look around, there's not a lot of those as it relates to how do you bring talent into an organization. And to what I said to you earlier about Aaron, like I would cringe when he would ask me the question, what's your, like, which, how, how are you doing hiring? Are you behind? And yeah. then it would be a 15 minute, like <laughs> just beat me up about yeah. why haven't I brought five people in and, and why is your number off from the HR number? But, but let me ask you this. Is it hard to get you fired up? Like, um, like the, how do I ask this? The conventional wisdom would say, don't try and convince someone who doesn't want another run to do another run. Right. I mean, um, the, the, the there was no convincing going on. But I mean, like, uh, what is it that, like, uh, how do you get fired up now? Right now? Like, are you fired up? Yeah. Like yeah, I, I believe. <laughs> absolutely. Like, you don't want to just, like, chill, hang out oh. with, like, help your kids, like, cold depends, call. Depends on where I am. If I'm in the city, I'm fired up. <laughs> if right. I'm in Carmel, I'm not. Right, right, right. I mean, it is, it is, so this environment has... Like where we do what we do really has like an energy to it. Can, actually, can I, can I dig in on this? Cause this has been a thorn in my side for a long time. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. No, I know, I, know I am. Um, can you provide any commentary on the things that you're seeing from Gem's perspective, being a recruiting platform um, and a talent pipeline platform um, on remote versus in person, in city hybrid? Like, do you have any, it doesn't even necessarily need to be data, more signals on efficacy of recruiting and the types of talent that people are getting, whether that's in person or if it's remote. Yeah, well, um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, you are. You're putting me on the spot, but I think. And the, it could be it doesn't have to be like I can tell it could you be anecdotal. Yeah. I mean, anecdotally, I think um, the problem is harder now because if you if you if as people move back into the office, it makes it harder to get the talent that they want. I mean, we all know that. Um, with regards to what Jem is doing, um, we don't have any like data that says, you know, back to office or mm -hmm. remote. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know we have our own point of view on this. What is it? <laughs> that being together makes a big difference. How often are you together? Um, well, we're going back to the office twice a week. Okay. And, and, you know, we, we made decisions in during COVID when I wasn't there that that was the kind of company we wanted to be, especially from an engineering perspective, because so much happens, you know, together. Um, we've had many debates about the data and the data doesn't say one way or the other right now. About it's too early which to is, tell. it's too early to tell. It's way too early to tell. It's and also, tell. there was no choice in what happened. Well, and I'm curious for 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 you having for, mostly built. Sorry, I interrupted again. No, Were you going to say no, something no, else? No, go okay. For it. Um, having mostly built inside sales teams, mm -hmm. where 
they are inside. They're in the office. They're behind desks. Like, I'm sure you also have a Ooh, interesting did. perspective on yeah, this, right? Very interesting perspective on it. Yes, I do. Um, maybe not a popular one. Um, I believe that there's a huge value to having people in person in inside sales early on in career roles because there's so much to be learned. Like there's so much peer learning that goes on. And I watched again, early in career roles. I watched what we had to do at segment to, to continue to have the kind of productivity that we had prior to COVID. And it all fell on the frontline managers. In other words, they were doing inordinate, like they're, they had to be in front of those people every single day to drive the, the productivity that we needed. I mean, being an SDR is a really hard job. Now imagine you're sitting in your bedroom mm -hmm. trying to make calls, right? It's crazy. It's crazy. And there's the camaraderie that happens when you're doing that hard work in a group is huge. I mean, my example from my first job was, you know, I was afraid to do something or another, like ask for something in a call. And I heard somebody next to me doing it. And I'm like, I'm going to go try that now. So, um, I just, I think the current world in where our world in which the, we do have remote, especially in sales. Now I'm taking field sales out of this because they're, they're at a certain point in their career. Mm -hmm. but and it's always been this way. Yeah. They've been and, out of the office. Exactly. Yeah. And the, but early on in career, when you're developing people, the place where you lose, where it becomes very hard is in that frontline manager. They are carrying everything. They are carrying like the, like, how do I grow this person? They're responsible for, um, making sure that they're building the pipeline that they need to build, that they're running the process they need to build. And they can't do, they, you know, they're trying to do it when distractions from a remote perspective are all, all over the place for those mm -hmm. people. And then I think there's also, you miss the sense of belonging and camaraderie and tribe that you get from being in the office. And some of the, if you just look at, I think you could go anywhere in San Francisco to any technology company and ask about somebody early on in career. If you talk to anybody at Salesforce, they would tell you about the 16 people that they remember doing X, Y, or Z with that have been their network going forward and their yeah. tribe going forward because of that experience. Yeah. Um, I just think it's incredibly hard to do that remotely. I completely agree. Um, um, this is a random question, but do you remember some of the toughest feedback that you've ever gotten about yourself? Maybe the toughest that... <laughs> you would consider yourself very grateful for now? <laughs> yes. What is it? Are you willing to share? Yeah, sure. Uh, by the way, I don't know the answer to this. Oh, you don't? No. Oh, I thought you may have gotten this from somebody that you talked to. Um, I mean, I've heard things here and there, but I don't have a definitive answer. Yeah, so um, at MySQL, I, so I was at Informatica before MySQL, and the, the kind of the mantra at Informatica was the, only the paranoid survive. Which was well in my, like, that was in my wheelhouse. That was so in my wheelhouse. Yeah, like, it's like, okay, got it. Yeah. Um, and therefore, like, this desire to control things was big for me. And then I, you know, then I went to an open source company where everything is a choice. Our customers have a choice. We have a choice about how we actually, what we do, what we, how we do what we do. So, you know, I can be forever free. I can be free for now, or I can be a potential buyer. I'm just going to use that as an example. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine that, that culture was in, like, that's the culture, right? We have a choice and we choose what we do every day. All right. So then I come in after the paranoid survive kind of culture, uh, to a remote sales organization because MySQL was one of the first companies that was all remote. So we had folks in um, Idaho. My whole team was in Idaho. I was in, I was in uh, Sunnyvale, and a lot of the rest of the team was scattered throughout, uh, throughout the United States and in Europe. <laughs> so I, I had to do sort of a, all right, evaluate the folks who are on the team and assess who's going to be there and then, like, move forward. Um. <laughs> I was probably there five or six months and I received a email from my team about, it was basically, <laughs> it was all of the things <laughs> that I was doing wrong. Um, it, it was kind of like, it came in an email? It came in an email. From your team? From my team. Yeah. 
it was like the the sales you know <laughs> basically they were they were they were um revolting that's a nice way of putting it anyway I, so i sat there and i'm like okay what do i do with this and it it it's like a wake up moment i'm like i didn't think i was this kind of person like that i was directive and i was being too hard on them in in forecast calls so I went to Mark, who was my boss at the time, and I said, I need your help. Like, what am I doing? Like, how do I respond to this? <laughs> and so I got on the phone with the entire team and I went through every single one of the, one of the things, every one of the grievan grievances, I'll call them, about the way that I was managing the team. I, I mean, it, I, first of all, it, it, it worked. In that they're like, wow, she's humble enough that she's willing to like listen and understand. Them? I addressed every single one of them. How? I didn't address. I read. I you like kind of read it back to them. I read it back to them. I Mark helped me. In, you know, like he said, well, Leslie, you're kind of this way there or that. And I I thought about what they had said and I asked them questions about what I needed to be doing differently. Yeah, it was it was a big moment. Can I, how old were you? <laughs> I was. Probably in my early thirties. Had been a manager. Yeah. Oh, I've been ma no. So my management style at Informatica, that management style worked. Um, and then management style was you hold people accountable and you. You were the VP of corporate sales. Mm hmm. And you're getting that feedback. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of culture it was, though. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it's just unbelievable. Yeah, but it was a great learning experience. I mean, I, the thing I took away from that is one, the way you do it is not necessarily the way that everybody does it. And you have to be open to letting people run their process. Now, if they have a plan and a process and they can tell you what it is and they get to the outcome, then like you let, you let them do it. Now that doesn't mean you don't have foundational things that you operate off of. But it does mean that everybody has their own culture that they're running. Um, it doesn't mean that, like my my big, big learning there was there are like five, six, seven paths to an outcome on a deal. It's it's does the pe person understand where they are in a deal? Does the person understand or or a manager understand how he or she is going to make the number? And what are the paths that they can articulate back to you that show that they have a good understanding and grasp mm -hmm. of their business? Um, versus do it Leslie's way. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, have you had to deliver, have you ever had to deliver feedback that tough yourself? Yes. Do you find it harder to deliver or receive that feedback? Deliver. Really? I, I, I thrive on <laughs> constructive criticism. It, it is like, I, I am very uncomfortable when somebody doesn't tell me hard feedback. Yeah. I need, I need because it. Because you get scared that you're not learning. I get scared that I'm not learning and I get scared that they're not telling me something. Right. Like I'm super paranoid all the time that I'm not doing a good enough job. Yeah. Or that you're missing something. That, that's right. That I'm missing something. You know, I think there's things you have, you realize about yourself that you don't, the way you do it doesn't have to necessarily be the way that they, like the CEO does it. You do it your own way. And. But isn't that ironic? Like you're very mm -hmm. paranoid about like you're not doing a good enough job. You're not even supposed to have a job right now. Like you're supposed to be retired. You know, like, like, uh, isn't it crazy that even at the very end of your career, like what might <laughs> yes. end up being the last job you ever have, you're still paranoid that you're not doing a good enough job, that you're missing something. Isn't that unbelievable? Like I go back to your comment and about your dad. You, <laughs> yeah. It's the yeah. same thing. Well, it drives me. I know I've had people tell me that, that you need to stop worrying so much about whether you're doing a good job or not. You're doing, you're, you're. I'm just doing the job that I know how to do. It's not the way that maybe somebody else will do. And I think that's the thing that we all suffer from. Well, you know, you look at the person, oh, they're doing it better than I am. Well, how do we know that? Like, you don't know what's going on. Right. Right. But I, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's, it, it is a driver for me. It always has been. I don't know where it comes from, candidly. Um, on the giving someone feedback, yeah. obviously don't say the person, but do you remember the feedback you had to give them? Oh, I've had a couple different ones. What do you feel like? What is the like? Are you sick to your stomach before you have to deliver it to them? Absolutely. Okay. I, in if, a way, I am. But but you think about you think about the benefit they will will get from it. 
like if how they you internalized it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I've watched people really take on feedback and change the way they show up. Um, and then to, to what I was saying a long time ago at the beginning of this conversation is that that's where people grow. If they take that on and they're willing to be coached, that's where all the growth comes. And I have had, I've had people come back and thank me for that. I've thanked people for that, for the feedback. Um, I, yeah, I have one story that's probably the one that's stuck with me the longest. I had to, I was at a point where I had somebody in the business who had gone from just killing it to not showing up, like kind of not showing up, like just mm-hmm. surviving. And I finally, I called in my office. I said, Hey, I need to ask you, like, I am in a position where I have to let you go if something doesn't change. And I'm like, I want to, I want to understand what hap- what's happening. And I think you need to do, if you, like, you need to do that. Like you need to, to ask the question because in this particular case, this person was staying at the hospital every night because he had a, uh, sick sister and she was afraid of being alone. So he was exhausted. He was, couldn't function. And I mean, and what he said is I will, Wesley, I will do whatever you need me to do. I just need to be able to do it in different hours. And I said, okay, like what you're going to do is figure out like how we're going to build the renewal business for Informatica and off of spreadsheets. And wow. it ended up being an $80 billion business in four years. I mean, wow. it was million, not billion, million. Wow. Um, but uh, you know, and I went to his, his wedding and his parents came and thanked me. Wow. Yeah. So I do think going all the way back to your question about feedback is as much as it feels painful and you're worried about how they're going to react to it. And you have to think a lot about like, you have to have very specific examples of what's the behavior and, and it's uncomfortable. Um, but it's well worth it to give it to them. Uh, I could do this for hours if you wouldn't believe it, but it's been an hour and a half. Was it really? Yeah. Um, (laughs) I, um, I, um, I want to change up the question. Uh, that I normally ask and ask a derivative of it because I know that you've already prepared for the what does grit mean to you question. And so um, maybe the question that I want to ask you is, um, do you think that um, it's nature? Do you think grit is nature or nurture? Do you think it could be taught or do you think it is innate? Oh God, that's so hard. It's sort of like will, right? It's like, uh, I... Oh, I've watched people change. So I think it can be taught. I, I, I think if people understand like at the heart of it and are not, they learn that making mistakes is part of the process. Cause I think a lot of grit comes from people not being afraid and having the courage to do things that they're uncomfortable with and to stick with it. And so if, if you give people the agency to make the mistake, or to, to do the thing that they're so, or to face the thing that they're so afraid of, then yeah. Um, I will tell you that, that the grit I have certainly came from the experiences that I had, but it wasn't through like my parents nurturing mm-hmm. me that way. It's, maybe it's their mindset that, that played into that. I'm all over the place on this because you are going back it. and fast. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's a tough question. It is a tough question. There's I think, like not a good answer, which is why you're, oscillating. The, yeah, it is. And I think, you know, I, I look at it like, what's the will I, I put will in there. Like, what is the will when you think about grit is gritty people have, it's like a will that drives them and that driving causes them to have a resilience and kind of a an integrity and character about like why they're doing what they're doing that they just won't let go of. Yeah. Um, I think back to I think about the person who is who runs our enterprise business right now. And he is, you know, he is one of the most humble, hardworking enterprise leaders I've ever met. And like it wasn't done like there's no being done. Mm. You know, and I think that's to me that's <laughs> you know, and he, he's told me stories that like really changed his behavior. He told me a story last week about what it was. that sort of changed that. Like mm-hmm. there was a point where he's like, you don't, you don't just get it. You yeah. have to work for it. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's not always easy and mm-hmm. it can be taken away. Mm-hmm. So like be thankful and keep trying. Yeah. I think that's a good answer. Um, are, are there any key roles that Jem is hiring for that you want to shout out? SDRs. SDRs. 
Nice. That's a good answer to hear right now. <laughs> it is. All right. Yeah, it's a hard job and we need Oh man, people if to do I it. was if I was early in my career and you were the CRO of a company, I would sprint to be an SDR in your <laughs> org. I would sprint. And it is what's the best way to apply or get a hold of you? Leslie at gem.com. Leslie, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.